On the engineering side, maybe a dark question, but do you think it's possible to use these machine learning methods to start to engineer proteins? And the next question is, uh, something uh, quite a few biologists are against, some are for, for study purposes, is to engineer viruses. Do you think machine learning, like something like AlphaFold could be used to engineer viruses? So to answering the first question, you know, it has been, you know, a part of the research in the protein science, the protein design is, you know, is uh, a very prominent areas of research, of course, you know, one of the pioneers is David Baker and Rosetta algorithm that, you know, essentially was doing the, the de novo design and was used to design new proteins, you know. And design of proteins means design of function. So like when you design a protein, you can control, I mean, the whole point of a protein, with the protein structure comes a function, like Correct. it's doing something. Correct. So you Correct. can design yeah. different things. That so you so can you do. can yeah. So you can do, uh, well. You can look at the proteins from the functional perspective. You can also look at the proteins from the structural perspective, right? So the structural building blocks. So if you want to have a building block of a certain shape, you can try to achieve it. Yes. By you know introducing a new pro uh, protein sequence and predicting, you know, uh, how it will fold. Mm -hmm. So uh, so with that, I mean it's it's a natural uh, one of the you know, natural uh, applications of these algorithms. Uh, now, talking about engineering a virus. With machine learning. With machine learning, right? So, so well, um, you know, so luckily for us, I mean, uh, we don't have that much data, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, we actually, you know, right now, one of the projects that we are uh, carrying on in the lab is we we we're, we're trying to develop a machine learning uh, algorithm that uh, determines the uh, whether or not the, the current strain is pathogenic, and the current strain of the coronavirus of, of the no, of the virus. I mean, so so there, there are applications oh, yeah. to coronaviruses because we have strains of SARS-CoV-2, also SARS-CoV, MERS that are pathogenic, but we also have strains of other coronaviruses that are you know not. Pathogenic. I mean, the the common cold uh, viruses and uh, you know and, and some other ones, right? So so uh, pathogenic meaning spreading. Uh, path pathogenic me means actually infl inflicting damage. damage. Correct. Uh, there are also some you know seasonal versus pandemic strains of influenza, right? And to determining the what are the molecular determinant, right? So that are built in into the protein sequence into the gene sequence, right? So, and uh, whether or not the machine learning can determine those deter uh, those components, right? Oh, interesting. So like using machine learning to, that's really interesting to, to, to given, give, the input is like uh, what the protein entire- sequence. The, the protein sequence, and then determine if this thing is gonna be able to do damage yeah. to, to, a, to a biological system. Yeah. So, so I it's mean, good so, machine learning. You're saying we don't have enough data for that? We, I mean, for for this specific one, we do. Uh, we might actually, uh, you know, have to back up on this because uh, we we're still in the process. There was uh, one uh, work uh, that appeared in Bioarchive by Eugene Kunin, who is one of these, you know, uh, pioneers in uh, in in evolutionary genomics, um, and they tried to look at this, uh, but uh, you know, the the methods were sort of standard. Uh, you know, supervised learning uh, methods. Uh, and now the question is, you know, can you, you know, advance it f further by by using, you know, not so standard methods, you know? So there's obviously a lot of hope in, in transfer learning where you mm -hmm. can actually try to transfer the information that the, the machine learning learns about the proper protein sequences, right? And, uh, you know, so, so there is, some promise in going this direction. But if we have this, it would be extremely useful because then we could essentially forecast the potential mutations that would make a current strain mm. more or less pathogenic. Uh, and right? anticipate, uh, exactly. anticipate them exactly. from a vaccine development That's, for the treatment, uh, anti, uh, any viral drug development. That, so, that would yeah. be a very crucial task. But you could also use that system to then say, how would we potentially modify this virus to make it more pathogenic? 
this th that's true that's true i mean uh you know the again the hope is well several things right so, so one is that you know it's even if you design a you know a, a sequence right so to carry out the actual experimental biology to ensure that mm. all the common components working you know is is a completely different matter difficult process yes uh then the the you know uh we've seen in the past the there could be some regulation of the the, the moment the scientific community yes. recognizes that it's now becoming no longer a sort of a a, a fun puzzle to you know for for yeah. machine learning could be people, a weapon yeah so so then there might be some regulation so i i think back in what 2000 15 there was you know the there was the issue on regulating the uh the research on um on influenza strains right that there were, were you know several groups uh you know use sort of the mutation analysis to to determine uh, whether or not this strain will jump from one species to another and i think there was like a half a year mor moratorium on 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 the research on on the paper published until you know uh scientists you know, analyzed it and decided that it's actually safe. Um, I forgot what that's called. Something of function, test of function. Gain of function, loss gain, of function. Gain of function, yeah, yeah. Gain of function, loss of function, that's right, sorry. Uh, it's it's like, let's watch this thing mutate for a while to see like, to see what kind of things we can observe. Um, I guess I'm not so much worried about that kind of research if there's a lot of regulation and if it's done very well and. With, with competence and seriously. I am more worried about kind of this, uh, you know, the, the the underlying aspect of this question is more like 50 years from now. Uh, speaking to the Drake equation, one, one of the parameters in the Drake equation is how long civilizations last. And that's that seems to be the most important value actually for calculating if there's other alien intelligent civilizations out there. That's where there's most variability. Uh, assuming like if life, if that percentage that life can emerge is like not zero, like if we're like, super unique, then it's the how long we last is, is basically the most important thing. So I'm, from, from a selfish perspective, but also from a Drake uh, equation perspective, I'm worried about the la our civilization lasting. And you kind of think about all the ways in which machine learning can be used to design greater weapons of destruction, right? And I mean, one way to ask that, if you look sort of 50 years from now, 100 years from now, would you be more worried about natural pandemics or engineered pandemics? Like who's who's the better designer of viruses, nature or humans, if we look down the line? I, I think, uh... In my view, I would still be worried about the natural pandemics, simply because I mean the the capacity uh, of the nature producing. Yeah, this it does is, pretty good job, right? Yes, and the motivation for using virus engineering viruses for uh, as a weapon is a weird one because uh, maybe you can correct me on this, but it's very it seems very difficult to target a virus, right? The whole point of a weapon, the way a rocket works, you have a starting point, you have an end point, and you, you're trying to hit a target. To, to hit a target with a virus is very difficult. It's basically just, right? It It's, the, the target would be the human species. <laughs> oh man. Yep. Yeah, I have, a, I have a hope in us. I'm forever optimistic that we will not, there's no, there's insufficient evil in the world to, do, to lead that to that kind of destruction. Well, uh, you know, I also hope that, I mean, that's what we see. I mean, uh, with the way we are getting connected, the world is getting connected. I think it it helps for the world to become more transparent. Yeah. So, so the information spread is, you know, I think it's one of the key things for the, for the society to be, Come more balanced, yeah. One way or another, this is something that people disagree with me on. But I do think that uh, the kind of secrecy that governments have. So you're kind of speaking more to the 
other aspects like uh, research community being more open, companies are being more open. Uh, government is still like, uh, <laughs> uh, we're talking about like military secrets. Yeah. I think I think military secrets of the kind that could destroy the world will become also a thing of the 20th century. It'll become more and more open. Yeah. Like I, I think nations will lose power in the 21st century, like lose sufficient power to where secrecy is. Transparency is more beneficial than secrecy. But of course that's not obvious. Let's, uh, let's hope so. Let's hope so that, that you know, the, 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 um, the governments will become more transparent.